me in the spot where the floppies be Till I give it a read, keep it crisp in the sleeve Every Tuesday night feels like Christmas Eve Living between Wednesdays What's up, folks? I'm your host, Conrad, on Wednesday Night Reviews, and tonight we're joined by Dan Barrick, and we're going to talk about their new comic that's out. Dan, thanks for coming on the show. Conrad, it's a thrill to be here. I'm really excited. Thank you for having me on. Glad to hear it, and thank you for coming on. Uh, First easy question for the folks out there who've never seen your face, never heard your name, who is Dan D.S. Barrick? Hey, everybody. I'm Dan or D.S. Barrick. D.S. Barrick, if you're looking up my stuff online or in comic shops or whatever, uh, Dan in real life. So um, I am a cartoonist from London, Ontario, Canada. Um, so I I guess I can touch some of the highlights of stuff I've worked on. Um, made my first mini comic when I was uh, in high school, like finishing high school in 2000, or no, not 2000, it was 1999. It was a different century, a different millennium. Um, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so I've made some other small press kind of comics, like local stuff. Uh, did a collection of comic strips called uh, Skullsy Thatcher, which uh, we made available. Me and my um, kind of cartooning partners in crime that I've done some stuff with, we we published that in a paperback collection a few years back. Um, and then the other thing people might know me from, uh, at least locally or somewhere online, is uh, Lucky Unlucky. Um, which is a comic book uh, created and written by Scott McDougall, who's a good friend of mine, awesome writer. Um, I drew that, so I do the pencils and inks on that book. There's uh, one issue out so far. We're going to eventually uh, release sort of a full-length graphic novel, so we're still working on it. Um, and that is painted by Aaron Elston, who does the colors on it. And then my most recent project is uh, Murgatroyd and Depenthe, which I'm excited to talk about tonight. Um, and I guess the one other thing I could say for local folks who maybe don't know me by name, if people are in London, Ontario, I do a bunch of the um, like branding artwork and design for Ellie Mood Comics and Games here in London, um, who I've known for uh, Carol and Gord there for quite a long time. And uh, it's been really fun to to do T-shirts. And we did a like a big vinyl applique mural down there um, in the fall, um, which is really cool. That's so cool. I'm, I'm glad you're so involved with your local community, your local comic shop. It's so um, important, for sure. That's awesome. Is that the, the shop that you go to when you pick up your regular books too? London has, uh, I don't know if you've been to London, uh, Conrad. It's been, it, it has an unusual number of comic book stores or has had for the oh. size uh, that it is. So we have a couple really good comic book stores. Um, we had the comic book collector, uh, which was... Um, I think it was maybe one of the oldest comic book stores in Canada, but it unfortunately has closed its doors uh, when the owner retired. Um, oh, okay. That's, yeah. that's different. That's yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but the two big ones that I frequent, uh, my kind of home store is LA mood. I've been going there since I was 15 or something, mid nineties in high school. Uh, originally because I was into, um, tabletop gaming um and was trying to pick up like star wars miniatures and stuff for the old west end games version of a star wars role-playing game um but uh you know they kind of became my home comic store and we also have an, another awesome store called uh, heroes uh comics um yeah and they're uh, they're awesome as well uh, i know some of the people who work down there and uh either of those options if you're if anyone's in town and is looking to pick up some cool stuff those are both great spots to go really friendly staff in both places i love it i love to hear that and and thank you for shouting them out we will be sure to throw up some images nice that's um cool. that that stuff makes me so happy um and yes we're, we're here today to talk about you already mentioned the title can you say it again for me because i don't yeah, want to say so it wrong I'm, I'm assuming because the one character's name is a greek word and I had to look up uh, pronunciation guides, too, because it's different to write it than it is to yeah. say it. Um, so Murgatroyd is the first character. That one's pretty straightforward. And then the second one is, I believe, pronounced Nepenthe. Nepenthe. Um, so Murgatroyd and Nepenthe is the name of the book. Beautiful. And and what a book it is. Um, I So I'm glad you prefaced by explaining that previously you've worked on a lot of it a lot of comics, um, whether it's zines, strips, um, because when I, I read through it and I, I've read through the 166 pages of it, I wanted to make sure I, 
I actually understood it, which I don't think I do actually, to be honest, but I that's tried. Probably, that's probably okay. That's probably kind of part of what I'm going for. I, I thought so. Um, because this book is wild. So the, the art style in it, and I want to be clear, you've written, drawn, all of that, correct? Yeah, this one's a solo project, yeah. Wow. Um, where to start? I, I guess for the folks at home who may pick this up and, and check it out, and I hope they do because it's a damn good book, um, what would you recommend they start with or that they know when they go into this? That's that's a really good question, and I'm glad you asked it because there are, I think, at least a few things that we can talk about tonight that hopefully like ease the transition into it. <laughs> um, because uh, to be honest, like one of my goals with this um, with this book is I, I really love weird comics. Um, one of the first things, uh, you know, like my I, I don't want to get too off your question here, but for me, the starting point was comic strips as a kid. That's what got me into comics. My dad had a um, big collection of the faucet peanut paperbacks in our front hall co closet. And it was like a thing in the summer, a rainy day, you can't go outside to play. You hit the closet in the front hall. And it's yeah, the bottom, yeah. yeah, it's like bottom is all coats and stuff. But then my dad had a bunch of books up there, um, nice. including stuff for like um, an older audience. Like there are a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, Conan books with like the first okay. like, covers on them. Um, but the section my brother and I always wanted to hit up was the comics. And so we had a bunch of these peanuts. Um, so it was interesting because I was reading peanuts in the eighties when I was a kid, mm -hmm. but also read like in the newspaper, but also reading these collections that had stuff from the fifties, sixties and seventies. Oh, and cool. I think the sixties and seventies are kind of like my favorite era for peanuts. Um, so it was just like a treasure trove as a kid to have all these books. There must have been like 20 of these little paperbacks. Um, okay. And then some other stuff mixed in, like um, really obscure things that I talk to people. And sometimes I've met like one person who's ever heard of some of these strips. There's one called Tumbleweeds, which is about cowboys. Okay. Um, which was interesting. Eek and Meek, which was like these mice who would have conversations with each other. And uh, I do remember as well, there was a little mad collection with some Sergio Aragones strips in it. Nice. Um, but um, from there, like when I got older, the transition for me, like I was reading Calvin and Hobbes, um, what got me into comic books was Bone, which I think is probably the case for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, like it was coming out, uh, Image was doing the reprints at that point where they had picked up the cartoon books title to give it more distribution. And mm -hmm. uh um, so that was such a good transition because it was black and white, like a bunch of the dailies and it had like Smith has that amazing, like animated kind of style to his artwork. Um, so that got me into, Oh, they're like, I can read a whole continuous narrative rather than, you know, it would be awesome. I'd love it when Bill Watterson would do like the, you know, the three week storyline in Calvin and Hobbes, but you get to the end and be like, I wish it kept going. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, now we're on to like a new story or some little, you know, just gaga day things. So Bone got me into that. And then um, sort of the next um, thing I think that kind of hooked me was um, uh, Jay Stevens, who's doing Dwellings right now. I don't know if you've been keeping up with his recent work, but he was doing um, The Land of Nod for Dark Horse, which was just this crazy... Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. Like it, it's a it's a cartoony superhero book, but totally off the wall and bonkers. Um, I had seen one of his comic strips cut out from Exclaim magazine and posted on a bulletin board. Nice. Um, but uh, that was a huge turning point. Seeing his stuff and it was just so bizarre, but it was so funny. Like it, I, it just cracked me up, and I thought I want to make comics that are this weird. And I guess, you know, going on, I discovered other, like going back stuff like Crazy Cat, which is just so bizarre, George Harriman. Um, and a big influence recently, I I had read it back in the late 90s, early 2000s, but I don't think I got it until I revisited it mm -hmm. a few years ago. Like I liked it, but I came back to the work of Jim Woodring, uh, who does Frank. Um, he recently had... Oh the giant uh, collection of his graphic novels with new material called one beautiful spring day. 
and uh, Woodring stuff just, um, it was a weird thing to like, like his stuff, but not really connect with it and then come back to it. And it really resonated for me. I have totally got off track <laughs> on your question, but it's uh, the first thing is like, I really wanted to make something weird. I wanted to make something that it doesn't totally make sense and hopefully find some humor in just the absurdity and whimsy and bizarre qualities that hopefully I could draw out of stuff. I mean, I think you did that a <laughs> thousand percent. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it was interesting. So the, the, the book itself, it's a 166 pages, a couple in the front, a couple in the back that are the, the legal stuff. Yeah. Um, and when I was going through it, cause I, I sat down in, in one sitting and, and went through it today by the time I was at the end, I found myself mentally taxed. Like I was getting tired because I'm oh, like, there's so much to understand and try and unravel, um, which is fascinating because I made based on that experience and how complex the book is, or at least I'm perceiving it to be. I started having assumptions about you, right? I, I thought you would be like this highly academic person and, and be like, oh, you know, my comic's the best comic there is. And, but, <laughs> but you're totally chill. You're like, yeah, I just want to make weird, cool comics, man. Um, <laughs> which is fascinating um, because it's just one of the, the, the thing I don't think a lot of people get to do is talk to comic creators, right? So right. like you could pick up like all of Chip Zdarsky's work and just on the feeling of his work alone, you could go, oh, Chip's probably a pretty cool guy. Right. But then to get to meet him would be very different. Or at least you would hope not. But you know what they say, never meet your heroes. Right, yeah. Um, whereas with you, it's been interesting because you're not what I expected, which is all the better. Um, <laughs> so, and, and again, I'm going to throw up some images of the comics so people can see what it looks oh, yeah, like sure. and how it is. Um, I guess... One of the things that I wanted to start asking is, how do you keep all the metaphors that you have in line? Um, and what I mean by that is, when the, the book opens, we're introduced to the titular characters, uh, Murgatroyd and uh, Nepenthe. Right. Yeah. And one, Murgatroyd looks like a skeleton nearly. Like, it's very uh, gaunt. Um, but not, like, sickly. He's just... It's the way he looks. And... Uh, Nepenthe's like I'm assuming a woman um, like mummified practically right. with just their legs sticking out and then their hair I took it as being like roots or some sort of plant life that just connected it to mm. the universe it's a very weird coupling and when we first meet um, Murgatroyd he's going on this sort of adventure he's probing asking questions and getting questions thrown back at him and they just started getting like weird like when they're traveling it and they're in a boat and murgatroyd's like which way are we going and nepenthe's like well which way are we going and he's like well we're going east the sun's behind us we're going east and then she's like don't think that linearly like you're thinking right. 2D, don't and yeah. then he looks down and there's a whole world below him and it's like okay and it just builds from there so like how do you keep the metaphors because they can be very vague or very big right. ideas that are very simple. How do you yeah. keep that all cohesive? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things I should have said in answer to your last question that will kind of connect to this as well <laughs> is one of the things that I've been thinking about as I'm doing this series um, is thinking about it like a comic strip in the sense that, one of the things that occurred to me about comic strips is that, um, you know, the conventional wisdom is that if we're telling a story, we're going to have a beginning, middle, end. That's like our foundational plot structure. Yeah. And I hope that the book does have some sense of beginning, middle, and end. But part of how I'm thinking about it is with a comic strip, if you pick up whatever comic strip you like, it's kind of all middle. There's not, like, if we think about Peanuts, like, you can think back to, uh, you know, the first strip with uh, Shermie being like, there's Charlie Brown, good old Charlie Brown, and he walks by, how I hate him, and that's the first strip. But you don't need to have ever seen that, because we keep getting kind of, you pick up where they are. What are the characters mm -hmm. doing this week? Oh, okay, like, we're down at the Ball Diamond, and 
Charlie Brown is depressed because he can't throw a strike. And we can kind of have a run of that. And then if you come, if you miss a bunch of them, you come back and you kind of reacclimatize to it. So I've been trying to think of this strip as kind of being all metal, um, which is kind of <laughs> a weird way to approach it, where I don't want to think too much about the beginning and the end. That um, I think a lot in terms, I, I don't know if this is conscious, uh, the last couple of years after the COVID stuff, um, yeah. I commute by, by bus um, most of the time. So I used to take the bus to work, bus home from work. And I was just, when they started opening stuff back up again, I thought, I don't know how comfortable I feel like riding pl- public transit mm-hmm. both ways. What can I do to just like kind of get out in fresh air? And I decided, oh, I'm going to time it out. I'm going to start walking back from work if I have enough time. And it turns out I did. So I ended up cool. walking home from work pretty much every day because I just like it. Um, stuff gets busy. You can put on, you know, some music, a podcast, uh I've been listening uh, to your to your videos, you. <laughs> which I need to sit down and watch them on a computer so I can see all the visuals. But I'm listening to some of those interviews or an audiobook or something. And I just found I really enjoy, I've always liked walking, but it's been something that's really become important to me. And funnily enough, I think that's part of what was going on in this book. Oh. I, I started doing the walks after. But I think I was thinking a lot about this idea of the whole pro- plot progression is Murgatroyd and Nepenthe are just going places all the time. The whole thrust of the book is they're just they just keep moving and they go through and they meet different people, explore different environments. So I think that's one of the guiding principles is the basic oh. formula, if there is one, is they're, they just keep walking. Um, now, in terms of the question, I think you asked sort of like this idea of like are there metaphors or like concepts that are going on there um i don't think i think metaphorically i think you could uh you know there could be emergent things that happen from that Mm -hmm. you know like if you're thinking about like i i think uh you had a question later on that we'll we'll get to (laughs) name um you know i think you could project some of that stuff onto it um i think the core idea that I try to hold on to for under, for myself, for understanding the two characters um, is that um, the imagination is a place they're going to walk through it. Um, who are these two people who were sent or beings or whatever entities that were sending through it? Um, well, it's almost to me like a, like a yin yang kind of thing where you got the, two halves that are opposed but you got a little bit of the element of of the one side and the other side where it's it's a little bit of each yeah so for murgatroyd um i see him his as and i'll have to clarify this because it sounds awful if i say it this way (laughs) i see him as being kind of like an embodiment of ignorance but not in like a malicious way right like not just inexperience he doesn't yeah, it, it, that's a very good way of putting it. He just doesn't have the experience, right? And it's not that he's open to it. He wants to find things out, but he's just kind of, here he is. He doesn't really know anything. Um, he knows a little bit, which is like that little element of, of you know, in the yin-yang. And for Nepenthe, um, she's kind of knows everything. Um, and part of the challenge was it's like, well, what's what's missing for her like what what does she not have um and and as i thought about it more um there's a little bit of the ignorance in there for her as well which i think we can maybe get into when we when we do a bit more of a dive into her character sure yeah it it's so cool getting to hear you talk about this because you, you're absolutely right in in out of the sake of the format that this book is in, like it, it comes as a graphic novel, but I really think it, it would be cool to see this as an actual, like never ending digital <laughs> script or something, right? You could oh, just man, keep that, next, page cool idea. next page. Um, it'd be cool because you're absolutely right. Like they're, they're constantly from the get go on the move, um, which, and again, just like, out of being a gamer, right? Like you fire up uh, Mega Man and oh, what do sure. you do? Well, you're yeah. starting here and you're headed there. Go. Right, right. Yeah. Whatever comes in your way, you deal with it, but go. Right. Um, so I never thought of anything like that. So hearing you say like, you know, I 
was thinking about walking to work and then, you know, I was taking transit again and I just decided to walk. It's cool to see that part of you get sort of thrown into the comic. Um, and the same thing with the, the, the yin and yang concept with Murgatroyd and I got to find her name. Um, Nepenthe, uh, because you're right. Like when, when I was reading them and in, in the way that the reader will first see them, it's very much Murgatroyd is this, wide eyes open oh my god what's going on where are we what are we doing and he's he's voraciously learning and questioning which is cool and then nepenthe you've and i love how you've drawn her with her eyes closed it's just like yep we're going this way we're fine this is what's happening whatever but excuse me no no problem um but later on um you know we'll get into this now True. As he's asking all these questions and she's giving these half answers and then asking him questions to get him to, I believe it was at first to get him to think, but then as events go on, she kind of becomes this indirect adversary to him where it's no longer clear that she wants just inherently what's the best for him. She has her own stuff going on. Um, and I really liked that because it was like, does she know what she's doing? And there's that little bit of ignorance or, or inexperience we were talking about. Um, so, yeah, let, let's talk about her. Um, so yeah. It, yeah, these I, were. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Really, no, please go ahead. So the names are like the weirdest names I'd ever seen. Her. So I was like, OK, what, what the heck are these names? Right. So I, I looked up Nepenthe um, and I'm like, oh, that that seems like, you know, Zeus, Nepenthe, Athena. Cool. We're good. And it, it was pretty right. Um, yeah. When I looked up Nepenthe, it is basically a, a Greek uh, medicine that was supposedly started in Egypt and they found it and brought it into Greece, whatever. Mm -hmm. Its goal is to actually help you forget stuff. Yeah. I would assume it was used, hopefully, to like help treat trauma, right? Like right. guys yeah, yeah. had to go into this battlefield of swords and armor and get bloody sure. and get cut up and destroyed yeah. and have a little bit of this Nepenthe, you know, you'll get over it. You'll be okay. Yeah. Um, I found that interesting because like this thing that's supposed to help you forget is an all knowing being in your book kind of. <laughs> um, so can you, yeah. Can you elaborate on the pen? Yeah, sure. So and, and, yeah. the, the dark secret, which makes me seem not quite so clever is that um, part of it was um, the approach for this book um, was I had these, two characters. Um, Nepenthe was actually a sketch that I did as part of a little series. Um, sometimes when I'm starting a project, I, I've got in this habit of drawing a bunch of little sketches in ink just to like get the drawing juices flowing. And so it was in actually in my last year of university, I was in um, a Bachelor of Fine Arts program and I was trying to change directions with what I was doing, moving into a final project for the big course that you have to do to get your degree. Uh, there's like a practicum two credit component. Um, and I thought I need to take this in a new direction. And so I drew a bunch of these little characters as kind of a running start into the graphic novel I ended up doing. Um, and the Penthe was one of those, I think there were about 40 of these drawings. Oh, um, wow. And I just thought she was really cool. And I hope Universal isn't listening because part of the inspiration was The Bride of Thank Frankenstein, um, where oh. it's like the big hair, right? And and like the lightning shocks through it. And I just, you know, thought this was a cool image of her being kind of like her body in that drawing. It's in the back of the book for anybody who picks it up, the first sketch of her. Um, uh, kind of ethereal and, and kind of nebulous. Um, but that was, uh, that was in 2002. And I just, at uh, the Murgatroyd's origin is I was talking to my, uh, I, I, uh, teach, uh, that's my day job. So I was taught, uh, oh, cool. teaching an art class about the elements and principles of design. And I tried to, we were talking about proportion. Um, and you know, a lot of time how, uh, as in, you know, a principle of design, that proportion is important to make sure that your figures look, yeah. um, normal. <laughs> <laughs> but then I want in ish to, you might want to draw something with weird proportions on purpose because it can be either kind of creepy or unsettling or funny and so i scribbled him on the whiteboard and mm. thought oh he turned out kind of cool and took a photo of him and that's why the quality of the image of him is so bad is because the only image i have of him 
from that original sketch it was like an old uh, Samsung Galaxy tablet that I was holding up and taking oh, wow. a photo with. So, um, but the names kind of came. Um, Nepenthe came from uh, actually it was a I had included the word Nepenthe in the context that you're talking about, just in a line of dialogue from another comic I had worked on. Mm-hmm. And where I had come across that word first was actually The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Um, oh. so there's a, a passage. In, I reread it tonight so that I would have new context because I actually had Love to look it. at like where in the poem, because I, I was thinking, oh, it has something to do, you know, like he's, he's kind of looking for that surcease from sorrow from mm. Lewis and Lenore. Um, but the passage it shows up in is actually, if I remember correctly, he's, he's basically like amused by the Raven's answer at this point is before he starts getting creeped out and freaked out by the bird. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, uh, it's, a, yeah, a it's quick note for, for the people out there. If you're going to go read the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, it is not like a little poem. It's multi-page. It's a, ma- it's like a book. It is <laughs> massive as a it's poem. It's a pretty goes. long poem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it's at the point where he, uh, He's still amused, right? That the the, the the bird, maybe all the bird can say is nevermore, and it still fits. It, it's a suitable answer to the question he asked kind of flippantly to the bird. And so he's feeling amused, but then he's describing how as he's kind of laying with or sitting with his head back on this uh, cushion on his chair, that he starts thinking about Lenore again and all his sorrows and is kind of admonishing himself and saying, God has sent you this Nepenthe, Uh, to help you forget like you've got this amusement and you're thinking about your dead love again um you know and then says you should you should drink the nepenthe um and and then the next question he asks the bird doesn't go so well Uh, (laughs) and (laughs) And that's where it does this (laughs) the downward spiral yeah so um it, it honestly was just a name and murgatroyd i have no idea where i picked up the name i feel like playing with my dad when i was a kid he made up some character who had that name and some like were playing in the backyard and i just i just thought it was a funny name uh and i know a lot of people would think of it from um snagglepuss right like the heavens to murgatroyd thing which i probably maybe that's where my dad got it from i don't know um but i just thought it was a funny pairing of names um but i do think you're right that there's some weird tension that comes from that because um on one hand, like rather than making him forget, she's actually teaching him stuff, or at least helping yeah. him learn stuff. Um, but I think it does fit to some extent loosely in the sense that um, with all the peril that he ends up experiencing in this environment, she is kind of the one force that he can rely on, at least partially, uh, to give him some protection because he has no real resources of his own at this mm-hmm. point. Um, but I do find it interesting that you talked about her becoming more adversarial as the book came kind of went on. Yeah, and I wanted to clarify like what I meant by that. It, it's yeah. not that Nepenthe started like attacking him or anything, <laughs> but right. the, the answers and the questions she would answer his questions with started becoming like vague. And, and like it, it didn't ever occur to me that it was like a malicious thing, but it was right. like maybe that was us as a reader hitting the point of her inexperience or her ignorance, yeah. where it was like maybe you don't have all the answers and you're trying your best, but the result of that is Murgatroyd's gonna get in trouble. Yeah, um, it was just yeah, it was fascinating. And then when the um, and. I didn't catch what its name was, so correct me if I'm wrong, but the eye monster is what I'm calling yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The, they the don't col- name it. It's in the title of one of the chapters, but they don't refer to it by name. It, it's called Bogey Plant in the title, um, Bogey Plant. But, okay. but it's not actually ever a, a identified with a name. Okay, so Bogey Plant. Yeah. Um, I, I loved Bogey Plant as well because it was fascinating that, again, with the, the pre- setup that we had of of um nepenthe giving murgatroyd all this information you then encounter this creature that certainly seems like it wants to go after uh, murgatroyd and what i loved about it was it was so undefined right like 
you had introduced things in the, the first chapter that were like kind of loose, right? Like Nepenthe's hair, head, whatever the, the thing is, yeah. is kind of like a weird thing that you can't quite, it's not real. Right. You can't like look at that and go, oh, on a human being, that's what that is. (laughs) Right. And then, like, like I said, Murgatroyd's kind of like this skeletal creature to me, just the way I I saw him. And with all the vagaries that she gives, especially like in the boat when they're traveling to then be introduced to this creature, that's its physical form because they're in imagination is just like wing dings weird shapes and then these big eyes uh and eventually we learn teeth yeah and what i I really dug about it was when it speaks it's speaking phonetically but also colloquially so mm. what i mean by that and i'm gonna put up a, a page sample of it for the, the 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 watchers out there um nope we've gone too far i th- nope uh connor where are you going um Okay, the weird triangle Christmas. I also appreciate if I'm muttering to myself about where I'm going, the reader will be, or the, the watchers out there will be so lost. Um, <laughs> Christmas. Where is he? There he is. Um, so in uh, in the pages you sent me, the sample pages, yeah. um, this is the, the first thing it's shown, which is we have Murgatroyd looking up, going like, uh, and this thing now that i'm looking at it again it kind of has a defined shape with like two arms but again it's all chaotic and and destroyed but he says howdy little cowpoke how are all y'all doing this afternoon but howdy h-o-w-d-y comma (laughs) l-i-l cowpoke k-o-w-p-o-k-e hower it's h-o-w-r no apostrophe (laughs) no e all y'all is a l l y o l l doing do you like it it's it's phonetically co- it's a colloquial way of speaking how y'all doing <laughs> but then you you spelt it phonetically and it's just like what am i looking at and it, it fits this creature because other than its face which is fairly clearly designed right whatever it's on page and it's moving and its shape is kind of woo, yeah it's just odd um and kind of what I, I wanted to ask about was basically one, what is it? And within the context of this story, um, what was sort of its meaning? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the part of what I, I try to approach with some of these more ambiguous things is I don't want to answer the question for myself completely. Um, because I like readers being able to, you know, project their own interpretation onto things, but it's important to have enough defined, I think, that the reader feels like the investment of time into trying to figure out what it means is worth that Mm. effort. Um, Because otherwise it just feels kind of random. It doesn't feel like there's any structure. There's nothing to find out. It's just kind of nonsense. Um, So for him, the points that, um, were important to me about him um, is, or it, I guess it doesn't have a, it's the a thing. Gender. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's uh, a lot of the creatures in, in, in this book don't necessarily have a gender because they're, um, they're just what they are. Um, but uh, it has, um, I wanted it to occupy a space between being kind of funny and being kind of medicine. Um, Because I felt to me, it makes me feel uncomfortable if it's not clear, does this thing intend to hurt me (laughs) or does it, it, does it not? It just being medicine isn't as unsettling to me as uh, it it being kind of playful at first. And I think uh, it it does intend to harm Murgatroyd for sure. (laughs) But it does. It approaches him in a way where he is just kind of conversational, and um, yeah, and I don't like that. <laughs> I do for a story, but if I were to encounter something like that, that would really bother me quite a lot. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it, it's such a creepy character, and and I don't want to give away spoilers, so I, I don't want to 
sure. talk about much further into the story than that. Um, but yeah, the way that you handle that is you, you've you executed in the book exactly what you wanted to. Because well, with all the stuff that came before it regarding like Christmas and, and, and the you know tinsel and snow and gifts and all that kind of stuff, when you see this creature... And it kind of has parts to it that look like trees. It's like, oh, it's like a, a living kind of festive Christmas creature. Yeah. And then as it keeps... Oh, I hadn't actually thought of that. Yeah, that does happen right after that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And then <laughs> as it, it keeps interacting with them, it just gets weirder. And weir- and you're like, what What, the, what is this thing? Um, so good job. Because oh, it's yeah. unsettling. It's weird. Um, one thing we, we haven't covered that I want to kind of cover... Um, it, it maybe you won't answer this question. I kind of suspect <laughs> you won't, but I guess in in a lot of you know modern books. Oh God, God I got like ten thousand beside you. Uh, let's pick one people know. Oh, okay, cool. Daredevil, very popular sure. comic book, superheroes. Yeah. Um, there's like a very clear defined. Well, like you said. You know, start middle end um you're not going for a start or an end just a middle um but there's always a very clear story flow of what's getting accomplished ideologies are spoken outright um to sort of give an easy sake of following clearly you don't care about the easy following bit or at least <laughs> not up front um what would you say to readers that like this book is about what is the um the message if you will if there is one that's a great question and this will be a little off the cuff because i don't know that i had thought about that clearly but i think part of it is um on some level um <sighs> this is going to sound way more existential than i intended to but like i'm our, I'm, I'm waiting for it <laughs> our lives like as we live them have a surface veneer of having more sense than what's happening to these characters. Um, but I don't know if that's actually true <laughs> in the sense that we, we build these relationships and structures and, you know, we do our nine to five, whatever, and have our routines and things, but there's a part of it. Like we're still in this, we don't have answers to all kinds of questions that we might, um, you know, we're, we gain more clarity as science, uh, advances but sometimes the answers actually end up creating even more you know okay. like mind-blowing possibilities you know it, when i first heard about like super gravity and m theory it's like oh we think we know what caused the big bang and i'm like cool let's hear it and it's like well we think it's like the m- membranes of different dimensions like slapping together and then there's a big bang and there might have been all and it's like wow <laughs> <laughs> that I sounds like it's from a comic book. Questions. This doesn't resolve <laughs> anything. And that's just amazing, you know? And and you, I think about it in both directions, too, where you can... We're also trying to figure out things on, like, a, a subatomic level. What's going on there? <laughs> um, so I think part of it is just this... If there's anything to it, it's just um, having some fun with the weirdness and absurdity of existence that we we do the best we can with what we're faced with and we find um the meaning and significance that we can within you know the the connections that we make with people and the things that we discover and uh at the end of the day again this sounds so morbid but uh (laughs) you know we're all we all have a finite time on this earth and um what i think about like what else are we here for than to experience things and learn from them? And, um, you know, I, I don't mean that. I mean, I mentioned I, you know, I teach as my day job, but I don't mean this in like an educational system uh, kind of perspective, but just like what else is there other than learning about where we are, what we're doing, where our species has come from and how do we, you know, try to mm-hmm. hopefully, um, gain some meaning and support other people who are in the same boat as as we are like that we're all nobody really knows what's going on <laughs> i mean we know parts of it and we know enough that like we have to you know apply the knowledge that we can so there's not utter complete chaos but um in a cosmic sense like we're all discovering that and trying to learn what we can oh absolutely that's too trippy sounding 
<laughs> no, it, that's, I knew that was coming somewhere. Like, like I said, like when I read this book, it, it immediately, like I, I saw the cover and I'm like, oh, cool. This could be like some interesting, wacky characters like Looney Tunes or something. And then as I got into it, it was almost immediately like, oh, this is like philosophical. This is, <laughs> this is out there. This has got like a lot into it. Um, and I was kind of waiting for that kind of answer. That was kind of, like I said earlier, I had sort of assumptions about you. That mentality, that level of um, thought, introspection, that's what I was like, it's in there. It's somewhere. Um, and I just, I knew we could get it out of you. Yeah. Um, I, I can just make a, a quick point, building on what you said, where you kind of said, oh, you know, the book kind of suggested one thing. And, you know, I, I'm very glad to hear that I don't, I don't, seem uh, like overly serious about these things because I think part of it to me is uh, you know that um, it is fascinating and like on a philosophical level there's so many things to explore and there's a level of ser seriousness but there's also a level of absurdity to it oh, it yeah. just reminded <laughs> me when you're talking about that of uh, um, uh, my brother and I talk about music quite a lot and one band that he's he's got me into recently is uh, Meshuga the the Swedish metal band um, yeah. and like their stuff is crazy like time signatures and and um, just like really it's wild wild stuff it's really cool it takes a, a bit to get into it it's a little bit <laughs> oh, intimidating yeah. at first um, but I remember like when I was reading about them someone had written a review of uh, one of their albums and it said basically one of their comments was Critics are going to look at this album and see it as a complete deconstruction of like the conventions of heavy music. But you get the sense that the guys in the band would just respond with shut up and listen to this sick riff. And that, <laughs> that's kind of like, that's where the space I, I would love to be in, where it's like, let's talk about serious things and, you know, try to apply some of these really cool concepts from philosophy or art history or criticism or theory um and do some wild things of investigating what's the reality we live live in but hopefully also have like like you said if it reminds you of looney tunes when you look at the cover that's great that's hopefully where this is kind of operating is a, a space between um absurdity and and kind of finding some kind of understanding it yes um a hundred percent that is right where you're living um because it's one of the things that when I, I read it and um, I, I think I finished reading it at like 3.30 ish today. And <laughs> well, I was going to say, if you read it in 3.30 in the morning, that sounds like Ooh. weird stuff might start happening. Probably. Don't oh, yeah, read. really? <laughs> yeah. No, no. Do not read this while in any sort of state inebriated. Don't do it while tired. Um, it, it's a lot. Um, but you kind of you live right in that space. And one of the things that before talking to you right with those assumptions that i had about maybe where mentally you were at and in and how you were operating um one of the things i compared it to was um uh cave carson has no cave carson saves the world or cave carson has a cybernetic eye yeah. um not at least not the way i know it not put out by dc because i know there's a series out there with right, yeah. the name cave carson from dc yeah but there's a, a graphic novel you can get and um they were studying it in university for a while in oh wow literature yeah. the book's like yay thick but when you open it there's no clear way to read it oh wow it, yeah and as you flip more and more pages it gets more and more confusing because you're not i don't think you're meant to read it front to back right interesting yeah yeah, and there's there's a lot going on with it. There's a lot of moving parts um, to the point where university students are studying it. Right. So my assumption going in was that's like that's how I looked at this book, right? I saw yeah. it and I was like, yeah. cute cover, <laughs> holy crap, dense material. But like, yeah, you, you kept it with such a flavor that it never became um, overpowering, right? Like if it was just dense, I would not finish it. I wouldn't have been able to, Thank you. but you had enough like weird zany moments, cute things. The characters are designed very well in, in a, 
not I wouldn't say the peanuts, but what they, they, they feel like they could fit with the peanuts characters. They're they're oh, light, yeah. they're interesting, but with that simplicity of character, you can get into really complex theoretical stuff. And like I said, I I expected a certain personality from you because of that. <laughs> um but to my surprise, you're like super chill and I love it. <laughs> um so We've blown way the hell past when I normally ask this. I like to ask this within like the first 15 minutes. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, it, <laughs> if someone's made it this far, they're clearly in. How do they get your book? What's oh, the best way? Oh, that's a great way? question, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even thought of that. I'm having such a good time chat- chatting about all this. So it is up on Crowdfunder at the moment. Um, it, we actually ended up with a much longer time frame for the campaign that I had planned because the uh, um, Canadian Creator Spotlight was happening. And so um, I had planned, I think, to end about a week after it started. I had seen the material about it and thought, oh, shoot, I could have kind of lined up with that. Um, but as it turns out, um, the folks at Crowdfunder were awesome and they just shot me a message. And we're like, do you want to come over and be part of this? And I thought, oh, that's cool. So it's still up until the end of May. Nice. Um, but I didn't want for backers who uh, were, um, you know, got in early when we were running the condensed kind of timeline. Um, I didn't want them to feel like they were waiting for their books too much longer than what I had promised them. And as well, we have a local con happening here in the in end of June. I want to make oh. sure I have books for the local crowd who, who want to come and pick it up. So that said, if you jump in soon, the books are actually at the printers right now. Um, and we got some extra copies in for that. Um, so we're fully funded, ready to go. Books are at the presses, I guess. So I'm super nervous about how everything will turn out. Uh, but, you know, double, triple check the files. We should be all good. And uh, yeah. have the books uh, going out to people, I guess, within the next month or so. Um, so the cool. address is Crowdfunder, which is c-r-o-w-d-f-u-n-d-r the e is not included dot mm-hmm. com slash murgatroyd which immediately makes me regret having such atypical names for characters because i'm like what if people don't know how to spell that and they can't get to my my campaign so crowdfunder.com slash murgatroyd or if you click on the creator spotlight there are lots of cool projects up there right yeah. now just like i was saying jay stevens one of my favorite cartoonists of all time has Dwellings number five up right now, which is killing it. He's over, I think he's over $11,000 raised right now. But that series, if you're into horror stuff, but also cute stuff, it's very disturbing, but in exceptionally well written. It's some of his best writing, I think, of his career. Awesome. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, also, I, I want to take a quick mention to shout out literally just Crowder, or Crowdfunder. Yeah. Um, because... A lot of the people that I know through doing what I do and, and people I've previously interviewed, yeah. they also have books out. Um, so real quick, uh, Jerome Cabanatan. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, Jerome's and, up there. Yeah. Uh, with um, his, his handbook, his Haya handbook. Yeah. Um, Jason Lapidus and Chris Sanigan with Group of right. Seven. Um, and I'm sure there's hundreds of more. And they're doing this Canadian Spotlight Creator thing, which I think is sick. Um, so thank you, Crowdfunder. Yeah. Um, and yeah. yes, Links down below to Dan's crowdfunder. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I want to make sure we got that in. And yeah, one thing, sure. so normally when I interview folks, it's a Kickstarter because that's just what's been popular. Yeah. yeah. Um, with Kickstarter, the way it's set up, you have your predefined campaign dates. Um, yeah. You have tiers where people can go in and say, oh, for, well, normally there's the the whatever you want to donate tier where you get nothing, but you can just say, hey, here's a couple sure, of yeah. You get like, here's a digital copy, here's a physical copy, and then it goes from there with variants and and get drawn into the book and this, that, and the other. Um, Crowdfunder is different. So Mm -hmm. uh, for the folks listening who want your book, as they should, um, how does Crowdfunder work? And and I always like to ask, what's like the minimum buy-in for maybe just a digital copy if you're offering it or just a uh, paperback? And like maybe what's if you have something, what's more like a, um, like a crazy high, you know, cost option. Yeah, sure. I tried to keep it really simple because this is my first time doing a, like a crowdfunding project. So in the past, we've basically 
tried to drum up interest uh, with the other guys I've worked with. Um, and then we go to our print run conventionally, and then we sell the books. Um, so this has been a really cool experience. And definitely, like you say, Crowdfunder has been awesome. Like, I'm really happy with the experience. We'll definitely, I think, be looking at using their services in the future again. Um, uh, but to answer your question about products, I tried to keep it really simple because it's my first one. So there are three levels only. Um, base level is, as you said, a digital copy, 10 bucks gets you the PDF, DRM free, oh. just like straightforward. Like you said, it's like 150 some odd pages. Um, That's a lot. There's uh, there's the full story. There are two backup stories. There's some sketches. We've got some uh, pinups by um, a local cartoonist friend of mine and uh, Jonathan Kusiuba. I haven't met him in person, so I hope I'm saying his name right. His uh, books. Are, oh, you can't see it. Yeah. The yellow book there. Oh, nice. That's his book. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. So he's he actually did two pinups for us. So two characters in the back. They're beautiful drawings. Um, so ten dollars for the PDF. Um, our most popular pledge level is kind of the straightforward thing. You get the PDF and the paperback book um, for 25 bucks. And it's Canadian. So if you're in the States, our money is not worth as much as yours. So come get a deal. <laughs> That's like what, 20, probably yeah, 18 USD, like, something like that. Yeah, It's, it's, it's pretty reasonable. Um, shipping's a little bit much, but remember you're paying Canadian dollars. So it'll, it'll balance out. And then um, for anyone who's in London, we do have a local pickup option. So you can pick it up at LA Mood, save the shipping, keep it easy. It'll be there for you once the book's out. The premium level is also pretty straightforward. Uh, it's 40 bucks Canadian. So just an extra 15, uh, you'll get a 60, a six by nine inch uh, sketch of one of the characters. You get to choose which one. There are 10 different uh, character options. Um, uh, Bogey Plant is not on there, but if you are watching this and you like Bogey Plant, um, <laughs> tell me that you watch uh, Wednesday Night Reviews and we'll hook you up. Choose somebody else and just send me a PM. I'll do that for you guys. So um, those are kind of the the three three levels. Really straightforward. Beautiful. And I think that's fantastically priced. Um, well, thank you. It, absolutely. Like the whenever someone offers a PDF um, – like I'm very clearly, I'm a physical comics guy. I've got like two thousand something comics beside. Yeah, Whoa. so and maybe this is a little prejudicial on my part. I always feel like they should be less, like not worthless, but cost less. Yes. Um, okay. and I think ten bucks for arguably your graphic novel, great price. Um, yeah. And the beauty is the book is done. So if someone backs you, they'll get it. Yeah. Um. I guess my question is, so with, with Kickstarters, normally it's, you know, at the end of the period, the money goes to the creator, they can then get it printed or whatever. Right. Um, a lot of the time it goes to, you know, pay the artist to finish the book and then they can give it to you. Right. Your book is done. Yes. So if someone backs it, is there like a month after the campaign ends, you're going to just mass ship everyone's PDFs out? Or is it like you back it, you get it? Okay. How's that working? Because I hadn't done it before and I wanted to make sure because I was still proofing the physical copy. I wanted the, the digital copy to be identical in content to the physical oh, okay. copy. So I had considered, like you said, I like that option of like you back it, you get it. Um, at this point, uh, the only thing stopping me from sending the PDF copies out on mass because we've sent the print files to print is just a time factor. So it probably will be in the next couple weeks that I'm just going to be sending everybody the link and they can get their copies. So it will be Sick. not instantaneous, but fairly, <laughs> fairly soon. Yeah, pretty darn quick. It's it's uploaded and ready. I just need to actually sit down and and make sure I'm sending those out to backers. So if people are pledging, you know, um, I don't know when you're going to release this, but uh, you know, uh, mid May, um, before the end of May for sure, you're getting your digital copy. Yeah, love it. Um, two things also. One, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dan, for um, making sure that the physical copy and the digital copy are the same. Yeah. Um, as a physical comics guy, there is nothing that drives me more nuts when there is extra stuff in the digital. Um, yes. Cause yeah. like, I just, no, I, I like the, that. yeah. So <laughs> thank you. Um, also another important question I've learned is that crowdfunder, once the campaign is over, 
apparently it's quite easy to roll it into a store. That's correct, yeah. So if someone is watching this, I don't know, in 2025, um, checking it out, uh, as long as it's still hosted, obviously, um, they'll be able to go into the store and buy a copy. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm definitely looking that. I haven't decided yet if I'm just going to roll the campaign over to the store or whether I'm going to set up another crowdfunder that just is a store. But I'll be on crowdfunder oh. sooner. I'm going to do one of those two things. So it will be definitely, if it's not this campaign, then if you search my name or Murgatroyd Nepenthe, I'm sure there won't be another book on there with that title. Uh, <laughs> it'll show up when you search for it and it, it will be after the campaign. It should be available for sure. I, I'm definitely looking into that storefront option. Yeah. Beautiful. Yep. Um, then you know what? We have spent an hour. I'm looking at the recording now. 56 minutes oh talking uh, about philosophy, existentialism, the, the meaning of comics and life and all this, this intense stuff. Um, it's also important to, it's important to me that people get to know you. Yeah. Um, now, thankfully early on, or earlier on, you covered sort of, you know, you, when you were growing up, you were reading peanuts. Yeah. Um, and, and bone and, and all those kind of great books. So we've covered, you know, why do you like comics? We, we got there. Sure. Um, Something I like to ask is, what are you currently reading? Like, what, is, what is it that scratches your brain? That's an awesome question. So I try to pre be prepared for this because I don't know if you have this problem, but when somebody asks me that question or they ask me a question like, what bands do you like? Instantly, there are like 12 bands that I'm super excited about or like 15 comics or graphic novels that I'm excited about. And I go blank and I don't remember anything. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. I like like uh like i i don't even know spider-man's cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so uh I, I actually just grabbed a stack so i won't forget i'll just go through the stack so i haven't this Bring is more it. like my to read pile um because while the campaign's been on i've been too swamped with it and i've fallen behind but while the cam ha campaign has been on i've been reading nancy oh. by olivia james um and i also was looking at some of the uh, John Stanley stuff that uh, Drawing Quarterly put out of the old Nancy comics. I've never read Na Nancy before, but it's super funny. It's weird. I tried reading some of it to my kids and they were like, we don't really get it. Um, yeah. Except my, my oldest daughter was like, this is cool. I like this. Let's read more of it. And my youngest who's six is like, I don't like Nancy. So I, I really enjoy Fair. it. Cool. Um, <laughs> one thing I just finished reading a little while ago is Pink Lemonade. Um, so the trade's coming out in the summer. It's by Nick Cagnetti, who uh, is an awesome cartoonist from Arizona. This is, I think, his first big series. It was a six-issue mm -hmm. miniseries from Oni. Um, kind of has, like, Madman vibes if you're into Mike Allred's uh, stuff. Um, very kind of, like, upbeat, positive. I felt, like, happy to be alive after reading this book. It's really good. And a complete uh, like 180 from that is I feel like this is a basic pick in that I feel like everybody likes it, but I'm a firm believer the popular things that doesn't preclude it from being really, really good. Something is Killing the Children is awesome. Uh, reading that every month. Um, because I have young kids, when the I hit the end of the first arc, I was just like, I don't know if I can even keep reading this, but I couldn't stay away from it. It's so compelling, beautifully written. The art is amazing, and it's scary as hell. It's it's a really good book. Um, also from Boom, a little bit lighter, but still on the creepy, creepy side. I've been enjoying Grimm, but I'm only up to about issue four or five, so I have to catch up on that one. Um my kids and I liked reading this together, John and the Impossible Monsters oh. by Chris and Laura Somney. Um, kind of an all ages like adventure book, uh, just a 12 issue miniseries. I think I just have the last two issues to read, but there's cool. a bit of a mystery in it too. So I'm interested to hear that out, uh, sort of figure out where it goes. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize how many I'd put in this stack. <laughs> um, you know, Powerbomb, I'm not a pro wrestling fan, but this has made me. Like totally wrong here. have you have you seen this book on there? I've seen it on the shelves. Yeah. Um, and it, it's that book is weird for me. Um, not that I'm not against reading it or whatever, or that I yeah. am, you know, not that I am against reading it. Um, I've noticed that uh, wrestling, like like American wrestling, yeah. is um 
it's huge in the nerd communities and it's something that I never personally touched on Me as neither. a kid. Yeah. Um, but I've heard very good things. I, I, I am not a wrestling fan either. Um, but if there's enough heart in this book and the artwork is amazing that I think you might check out the first issue, see what you think. I, I was pretty drawn in by this and, and, uh, Daniel Warren Johnson, his artist is, is pretty cool. Uh, oh, I mentioned yeah. Jay Stevens. I have to catch up on dwellings number four, but number five is up on crowdfunder. So that's a good one to check out. I have to go down. This isn't a new book, but I have to go down to my local shop and pick up. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the art of uh, John Ken Mortensen. Um, he draws these weird monsters and stuff. Uh, it's very Whoa. creepy. And this book is all like post-it note drawings that are reproduced from actual post-it notes he drew on. Um, but he has a new one from Fantagraphics. I believe it's just illustrations. It's not a comic. So it's, it's comic just Jason. Um, it's called Night Terrors and it looks super <sighs> creepy. Um, so I still need to get back to the demon by Kirby. Um, so some old school DC horror, go for it. She's then really enjoying it. And then I just got this in the mail today. Uh, I don't really know much about it, but it just looks really cool. Uh, Sludgy by Rob Mirsky. It's an indie book, um, like a small press book. Um, so I know you often ask your guests. Who should I interview? Yeah, it was going to be the next I, one. I know nothing about this book or this creator, but I'd be really interested if you can get a hold of him and see what's up. And my other uh, person is a local guy. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Scott Brian Woods. Uh, he's a local comic creator. He has a, a book from a bigger publisher coming out later called Equilibrium. But he has his fantasy series uh, called No Rask for the Wicked. And then he also has a sci-fi series that he just started called um, uh, Daring the Sun. Sorry, it took me a while to remember the title. Um, but both of those guys, like Scott Brian Woods or Rob Mirsky, if you're doing interviews, I'd love to see those guys on your channel. I'll go after them. That sounds so cool. Thanks for uh, sticking with me through that giant pile. I, I, I think in my mind it was like five books, but I, I think I had a few more in there. I've got a lot of reading to do. It, I call that sh um, reading pile syndrome. I have, I, I believe I have beside me a short box and a half. That's my reading pile. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> oh no. I think secretly we're all like, oh yeah, I'm totally caught up on my reading. Right. Yeah, I read that issue last week. We're all like 10 issues behind on everything. Yeah. Now, Conrad, I, I really hate to do this, but um, because I know you probably have a bit of a time constraint. Um, do you mind if I just touch on a couple things? Because uh, there were a couple questions you asked that um, I just wanted to add a little bit to that I thought, you know, you had asked and I didn't quite answer it with with the complete information that I think might be interesting to people. Um, just do me one favor. Yeah, no problem. S state the question or it. If it can totally come to mind, oh, I'll restate sure, the question. And in. that, no, it's just okay. that way there's the full context. So, oh, just, sure, yeah. 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 So, um, one of the things we were talking about is just kind of Nepenthe's personality and her, um, like, what's that limitation? Like, what's the element of ignorance within her? And I think what I ultimately settled on was um, she has a limit to her understanding of what it's like to not be <laughs> all powerful and all knowing um it's it i think part of it for me came from the, there's like the the superman problem right that all the dc guys talk about writing like i've heard grant morrison talk about you know how do you write superman and how they approached mm -hmm. writing superman and trying to try to if he can do anything um so what it realized to me is well if Nepenthe can do anything, what if she just won't? <laughs> um, oh, so, cool. so, and I think about it from as a, you know, as a teacher, but also as a parent, one thing I try to be cognizant of, but I think it's really easy if you're in a place of position, uh, sorry, place of experience, a position of experience that you're working with younger people mm -hmm. is it's easy to kind of like, intellectually understand the struggles they're going through uh you know like um i'm trying to think of right. an example but like you know my son being really upset about what's for supper 
And you think from a long view of like, I remember when I was a kid and my mom served me something I didn't want to eat. And eventually another supper came and it was fine. And I don't think much about, you know, that one day that eggplant was for supper and I couldn't stand eggplant. He'll get over it. So I try to think about like what's, because we have all these skills of resiliency and, and, you know, like dealing with problems as an adult that even when I'm counseling students, I, I teach art. Um, yeah. Sometimes kids get really discouraged, right? And when you, you've been doing art for a while, you know, not that um, people who are still making art into their adulthood don't face that self-doubt and struggle. But you don't have that same feeling of like, I have, I can't really point to something where I had a struggle and I overcame it. You think back and you think, oh, I had all these struggles, but look, like I finished this project and I'm pretty proud of this thing. I got a few things I can point to if I start to beat myself up about stuff. But sometimes if it's like a grade nine art student and they've never done a painting before and it's a disaster, that does feel like the end of the world to them. And I think yeah. Pemphy lacks that ability because it's been like she doesn't have those experiences of being unable to do th things that she might intellectually understand that Murgatroyd is having trouble with something. Um, but <laughs> she doesn't really have that much ability to empathize with him that it goes very well all the time. So she kind of leaves mm -hmm. him to do these things. And as I was thinking, I was thinking, is there another character that I can think of? Like, where did I get this idea? And I think the closest connection I came to was uh, Gandalf, specifically in The Hobbit, when you start realizing oh, yeah. he's kind of a jerk some of the time, not because he means to be, but when you're a wizard and you're dealing with a bunch of like measly dwarves and a hobbit, I think of that part specifically in the novel, because in the Jackson movies, it just exploded everything out with maybe too much detail. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but there's the part where they get to Mirkwood and, uh, Gandalf is just like, okay, guys, see you. I got to deal with a necromancer. And it's like, Jackson explains who the necromancer is, gives you some context. But in the novel, it's just like, what necromancer? Yeah, like, he's just gone. But like, and, uh, and Nepenthe is kind of like that too. And I realized I had written this scene in. You, you had talked about, uh, you mentioned Murgatroyd kind of being the main character. And I think that's very true. I didn't realize that at first. It is mm. about the two of them, but his name comes first, I think, fittingly, because if it was Nepenthe's book, I'd have to draw it as if, like, none of it would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> because what she's doing, like, there is one chapter in the book, I think there are two chapters in the book, where we see what she's doing when she's not with Murgatroyd. And I tried to draw it, it does have a logic to it, but I tried to draw it from, okay, what, what makes sense to her? Um, and it doesn't make much sense. Um, and it, Again, it's kind of like Gandalf where it's like, yeah, no, you guys, you guys go in there. I know there are like spiders that can talk and are giant and are probably going to kill you, but I'm sure you'll be fine. I would be. So. Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's one of those things where, and I believe, I truly believe everyone can, can sympathize with this or at least empathize with it yeah. or like. Like you said, on an intellectual level, we can understand where someone else is struggling with sure, something yeah. that we're very good at. But you can't yourself remember really. You don't. You no longer feel what it's like because when you hit the same yeah, challenge, yeah. you're like, "Oh, solution, yeah, no problem." Yeah, I know how to do deal with that. It sucked. It was bad, but I know how to deal with that now. So, but you'll be fine. Yeah, but you're not feeling what they're yeah. feeling, and that's important. Uh, the other point uh, just was uh, you had asked about um, in the question you sent me, we talked about bogey plan and kind of like how he evolved. Um, but you had mentioned kind of the character design, like how did I come up with the character design? Yeah. Um, and I have a good story for that because it, it actually uh, slightly preceding um, working on this project to start to get really obsessed with fountain pens so oh. uh, people who have seen some of my uh, later book I, uh, or lit earlier work, I should say, I do really like still working with India ink and like a brush and doing like the thick, juicy kind of outlines. This is a really scratchy kind of thing because I want to draw in fountain pen. Bogey paint plant came across because I got a hold of a specific kind of fountain pen, excuse me, that I never heard of before uh, called a food a pen, 
which is a Japanese pen that's designed with a bent nib. Um, and the reason for it is so you can, um, if you're writing in kanji characters, uh, you can um, alter oh. the thickness of the pen stroke like you're using a brush. Um, so if you hold the pen very vertically, uh, it can give you an extremely thin line. And as you draw it back, if you start to decrease the angle, like make it lower, the line gets thicker. And if you go across, you can get this really thick, chunky line. Yeah. And so the character partially came out of... I want to draw the backgrounds in this scene where we're out in this wilderness um, with this big chunky pen that I, um, because, you know, I don't know how to write in Japanese or Korean or Chinese. I don't know how to use it properly. I'm using it to try to draw with a lot of it was kind of like wrestling with the tool. And so his um, character is exp explicitly linked to I need to draw him with this pen. I actually have to get a different pen out to draw that character, which that's is kind so of a cool. fun way to approach a character where he has like a certain tool that's that's tied to him. That's really cool. And and as I imagine as a creator, um, whether you're aware of it or not, perhaps like mentally that you, you have to physically re-gear how you're using your tool mentally to, too. That must play on, like the sensation you're feeling, how it's working, which yeah. will ultimately always make that character feel on the page to the reader different, which is so cool. I, I think that's a good point because I think about like, if I'm going to draw him again, it's easy to get back in that zone because it's like, I have to move my hand and hold the pen in different ways to draw him than any of the other characters require. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Um, the last thing I just want to show you had asked earlier really what might help people understand the weirdness. This is like the last little bit of secret sauce. Um, this box contains uh, Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt's oblique strategies. Have you ever heard of these before? Okay. So this is, um, again, with a, a little bit of a music connection, I'm a huge David Bowie fan. Uh, like, love every era of Bowie. But my favorite Bowie era is... Um, between uh, Station to Station 1976 up to Scary Monsters in uh, 1980. Um, okay. Right, right in the middle of that is what um, is usually referred to as his Berlin trilogy, which is uh, Low Heroes and Lodger. And he was working okay. with uh, Brian Ito, who's an artist and music producer at the time. Um, basically, Bowie had asked him to collaborate because he liked what he was doing. I think with like Roxy music, uh, you know, as part of that group for a while um, and thought that, you know, he could go in a whole different direction if they were working together and sharing ideas. And one of the mm -hmm. things, you know, brought is he had come up with this box of cards um, with another artist. He knew Peter Schmidt um, that basically the idea is uh, it's a bunch of really obscure advice if you get stuck with an art problem, oh. you're, you can either, uh, I think there's an instruction card that comes with it, but it tells you essentially either pick a card, do what it says, or, uh, you know, fan out the cards and try to find one that picks, uh, that fits your problem. So what, how I've tried to approach Murgatroyd and Nepenthe is I had this idea, I'm going to draw a different card for each chapter and I have to figure out how I'm going to incorporate that into the way I resolve the chapter. And I thought, if I don't know how this is going to work, my reader definitely won't. And sometimes it's really frustrating. I'm, I'm trying to make problems for myself on purpose to, you know, stay out of my comfort zone. Um, the intro says, um, what does it say here? There's a bunch of text, but part of it says, uh, you can draw a single card from a shuffled pack when a dilemma occurs in a working situation. In this case, the card is trusted, even if its appropriateness is quite unclear. Um, so that's what I've tried to stick to. For example, this one just on the top is go outside, shut the door. I have no idea what that means, but if I'm working on a chapter for the book, I, uh, I have to figure out a way to incorporate it. So um, obviously that's these are... Cool. You know, and Schmidt's intellectual property, so I can't uh, post a, a link anywhere. Uh, I can I can send you a document, Conrad. But anybody yeah. else, 
hit me up at a convention. I can show you which ones I used for which chapters. Uh, it's just really fun because uh, the the classic story is uh, there's a song called Blackout on Heroes. I, I hope I'm telling this right, but uh, Bowie and Eno each drew a card and they were like, we're going to try to do what the card says, but we're not going to tell each other what's on Ooh. the card. And uh, Bowie drew one that was something along the lines of emphasized differences. And Eno's coincidentally was emphasized similarities. So without knowing it, they were in like this battle of trying to influence the sound of the song Interesting. in two different directions. Um, anyway, that's kind of the last kind of weird art element that I, I tried to bake into this project. Okay. Um, mm, okay, one more question for you, because I think this will be interesting uh, from a creative standpoint. Given there's no beginning or end of the story, you're, you're just basically creating sort of ever-moving content, right? Like anyone right. would be able to read this basically in any order. Yeah. Um, in the, the book as it is, each chapter is labeled, you know, one and then a title, two title. Um, I guess my question is, um, if it wasn't for the sake of like publication and chronology and in some way on a human level communicating what we're talking about, would you remove the uh, the numbering of the chapters and just title? That's a good question. I do think... I do see it as being linear, but I see it as being you can jump in at any point. I don't okay. think that the chapters would make sense if I changed the order, although that's an interesting experiment. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I do see it as kind of, uh, it, it is conventional in the sense that it, it does need to be um, read in order, but I do think mm. you can jump in at any point and eventually, I'm trying at least for the comic strip, idea of if I week, uh, read a week's worth of dailies, I'm going to know kind of what the strip is about that okay. hopefully people could jump in. And this will be the experiment for the second book. I'm really interested to know if people start with book two when that comes out. With, does it make sense without reading book, book one? one? I hope and... that it does. I hope that it would be like, oh, that was a cool story. I don't know what's going on for the first 10 pages. Now I kind of know what it is. It would be cool to go back and, and read volume one, but I don't feel like I necessarily have to. But I'm not sure if it will work. When's book two? So it's drawn <laughs> completely. It's finished. Um, this is heck. Yeah, so it, it is done. Um, I have to do... Um, the uh back matter kind of stuff for it um so there the like the current book there are two short stories so i have to draw the second short story and then i have to do all the graphic design um so my hope is that at latest we'd be seeing same time next year book is out uh i'm hoping to i don't think i can get it uh early enough that it would be before i've you know one of your recent guests I was watching. Um, oh, darn, I forget her name. Um, name the, the book. The, the book where death is broken. It sounds super cool. And it has, uh, uh, I think Jude is the main character. It's like a weird apocalypse where no one can. Oh, <laughs> um, Path of the Pale Rider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one. It sounds super cool. I'm really interested to check that one out. But she had mentioned how there's kind of that dead zone leading up to the holidays. So I, I would like to get it like early, early 2024, if we can, that we're, we're back on crowdfunder. Well, I, I'd love to have you back on for it. And I well, will thanks. very yeah. intentionally, I will read it. I will force my partner to read it without giving her the first one. Amazing. That would be so cool. I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, that's awesome. Perfect. Well, Dan, we, we've got a little bit past the hour, which is yeah, fine with I, me. I really thank you for letting me uh, add a little, get extra in there. Thank you for being Hell possible. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, again, Dan, it was so great to have you on. So thank you for taking the time tonight. Oh, it's been a real pleasure, Conrad. I, I really appreciate all your kind words. And um, I think what you're doing with this show is really important. Um, just shining that light. Like, I'm so excited to go through your back catalog and see what are some of these books where, um, you know, I'm not aware of who these creators are 
and you know it is really hard to reach an audience so thank you for helping you know people with little projects like mine and you know some of these other cool people maybe reach a few more people because as much as like you know i'm not down on the big publishers i love stuff from marvel and dc too um but i think you really give people an opportunity to see the breadth of what comics can offer because there's so much going on it's it's a whole expansive world and uh I love what you're doing to, you know, bring so much enthusiasm to to some of these small, awesome projects. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, thank you again for coming on. And um, yeah, for the folks at home on YouTube land right now, links down below. First link will be for the crowdfunder. Go now. Get the book. Ten dollars for digital. Twenty five for physical. Right. That's right. Yeah. Perfect. And. 45 for it's 40 for the sketch uh plus the book and every pledge level comes with digital so you're not you're not giving up the option to read on your phone or your ipad if you go physical you still get that convenience love it so spend the 40 bucks get the sketch get the digital get the physical just do it um and absolutely Thank you for tuning in. Like, comment down below what you thought, uh, and subscribe for more. And we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Golden age to present, digest to oversize. Never miss new comic day. Yeah, no surprise. So where's my no prize? Check the letter columns. Can't find issue two. Yeah. Collector problems, cliffhangers, mysteries. You need answers. When did Batman become Green Lantern? I get it. True believer, not lying. Always up for an awesome summer crossover tie-in. High flying, full color or black and white. Splash pages, flashbacks. Wet your appetite with new costumes, team-ups, first loves, first appearances.